Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for coming today evening. And uh, I think we've been through it's almost after six, seven years. We are having a program in your home here. I think long before the pandemic, most of the time we have programs in the temple. So it's wonderful to be here also. Mm -hmm. Living in Sudan, Gundi Chavati is home. I think that's the other. With the parents of the congregation, I feel. Since the first time I came here, for the first time only, they were here through, but he saw me, he gave me a big hug. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in the cold of America, I felt the warmth of his affection. <laughs> so, of course, many of you know tomorrow it is his auspicious birthday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, I wish you very, really, very really happy returns of the day too. Mm -hmm. Over the years, the way, you know, through your love and care and thoughtfulness and service attitude, you nourish this community and every devotee, every brahmachari who comes from India, whenever I, uh, here, whenever I talk with them, one of the high points of their memory is coming to your home and getting the hospitality of both of you as well as being like a community which you have helped nurture so lovingly. Mm -hmm. I was in Naperville some time ago and there also we have a nice community of Indian devotees coming up. Money, so I was telling them that you should replicate the Edison what they can do over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank you for your amazing service and I seek your blessings so that I can also do my some small service on my side. Thank you. Very close to my heart, I can say is one of my and my three Shiksha Guru is one of the top. Um, I really, really have driven so much inspiration from his wisdom. Um, I remember, when when did you come first time? 2014. 14, yeah. So it must be 13. Then I was listening some online classes. I believe he gave some class in Ravagopina temple or somewhere. And it was just my head was like blowing, you know, that who can go this deep and this and, and with the humility, with Vaishnava etiquette. And I remember picking up the phone, my cell phone, and calling from office. I found his phone number through somebody. I never knew him, never spoke with him. And I called and I said, Prabhuji, you must come to America. Mm -hmm. I said, this is your place. So he said, well, I never came, visa, other things, other things. I said, everything, Krishna will arrange, but uh, you please come. Um, Somewhere or another, he arranged his visa. We didn't do anything, and you know, Krishna arranged everything. Started coming and <coughs> touching so many hearts. And I think since then, he didn't go to any other country either, right? Before America, you, you went to UK or other places? No, Australia was the first country, America was the king. But America has been spending the most time. But since then, uh, he's been visiting uh, Australia, UK, and spending like good three months in America, one month in Australia, what other? One month in UK. Yeah, and India. And the devotees just love him so much because of his, the way now he started drawing and making flowcharts. So all, all of us are like, we have some background from computer science and we like these arrows and flowcharts. <laughs> <laughs> Just like mesmerizing how easy Krishna consciousness is through his you know, way of presentation and going so deep and touching our hearts. I really, my life is indebted to you, really. I wish I could just... I told him once in one of these years in 2014 and now in last week, I said, 
maybe Krishna can make me your driver. I can drive you around the world, you know, one of these days. But it's really you can drive me back to God and the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's this way. <laughs> Krishna, Krishna. But I have that longing. Like, and Chaitanya Charan, Chaitanya, Chaitanya was always worshipping Devaki Nandan. I'm happy to lose. I will never win here. <laughs> So we have Gaur Purnima coming next week and uh, we have Ram Nami coming afterwards. In India there is a lot of Ram consciousness yeah. after the Ram temple mm -hmm. and uh, our devotees in, in Ayodhya are doing amazing service, distributing so many, so much prasad, so many books and I was also there, we had very beautiful darshan of Ram Lalla over there and our movement is also acquiring a very big property over there and we plan to have a guest house. So, very good and others can also come. And experience this wave of devotion that is coming. So, I have been writing a book on the Ramayana. So, I also studying Gaur Lila a little bit because of Gaur Purnima. So, I have been exploring what are the parallels between the two. So, there are many subtle parallels which can be drawn, but I'll focus on a few broad principles and I'll go into one pastime which illustrates certain key points. So, if we consider from one perspective that the previous, most of the, like Lord Ram and Lord Krishna, they came as Kshatriyas. Kauranga Mahaprabhu comes as a Brahmana. And that itself shapes their mission differently. See, the Lord is about time. The Lord is about time and place. That's what it means to be transcendent. At the same time, when he appears at a particular place, more or less, he first fits into that place and then he rises above that place. That means, when Lord Ram appears, so it's like, the spiritual domain, this is the material domain level. So when the Lord, Lord is eternally present here in the spiritual domain. Now we are talking here Lord specifically as Bhagavan, as Paramatma is present in this world also. As Bhagavan, he is present in the spiritual world eternal. Then as an avatar, he descends to this world. And he stays here, and then after that, he departs from this world. And like that, he keeps coming intermittently. Sambhavami Yuge. Okay. When he comes repeatedly, his overall purpose is to establish the Yuga Dharma at that particular time. So, and of course, he <coughs> performs Leela, which is what is remembered by others. So in one sense, the establishment of Dharma is for that time. Dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhava yuge. But then what about other times? After he comes and goes, will again disorder come? Well, yes and no. What the Lord does is, after he departs, there is a legacy that he leaves. And the legacy that he leaves is in terms of two things. His Leela and his Shiksha. What he has done, his pastimes and his teachings. Now, his pastimes and his teachings, they can guide us for the rest of for the rest of history. There are special times in history when the Lord appears. And for remaining times in history, as Kunti Maharani says, Bhavesmin Krishyamana Avidya Kama 
श्रवण स्मरणार्हि करिष्यन इति कीचन सो ब्रॉडली स्पीकिंग दिस इज दिस आर ब्रॉड दिस आर नॉट एब्सोल्यूट वाटर टाइप कैटेगराइजेशंस बट द लीला इज फॉर द मन फॉर द माइंड वी कैन गेट अब्जॉर्प्शन द शिक्षा इज फॉर द बुद्धि दैट गिव्स अस कन्विक्शन द कन्विक्शन एंड अब्जॉर्प्शन आर रिलेटेड बट जनरली If somebody is watching a movie, and if it's a good movie, then you don't say, "Oh, I have to concentrate on this movie." <laughs> no, if you have to concentrate on the movie, that means the movie director did a lousy job, isn't it? The movie should be absorbed. In writing, it is said that what is written without effort has to be read with effort. <laughs> <laughs> so, if the author does not do the work of thinking through the thoughts, then the Right, reader has to figure out what are you, what are you written over here, what are you saying. But the point overall is that. So the Lord provides sustenance for us for both, and that is the enduring legacy which He provides. In fact, you see in the Bhagavad Gita also, four, seven, and eight is Dharma Samsthapana Artha Sambhavam Yogi. And four, nine, and ten is about his dina. Janma karma che main divya, evam yogita bata. Maybe some of you can come here. Are you able to see this? Or maybe you don't want to see this? So, so when the Lord descends, he the Janma Karma Chhemedi Bim. That verse is about if for all time which people can remember him, and then they can maave the they can come back to him. So the Lord does both these things. The Lord Ram came thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, Redwood Speech Adam Mahaprabhu came recently. So the first commonality is that. They share the mission. What is the mission of the Lord? It's, it's, in one sense, there are many specifics, but there is one common mission: the divine descent mm -hmm. is meant to inspire the human ascent. So the Lord comes to inspire us, to instruct us, so that we can raise our consciousness. And ultimately, we can raise ourselves from the material world to the spiritual world. So that is the you could say the universal mission of all of us. Now, having said this, apart from this universal mission, there are specific missions at specific times. And generally, when the Lord comes to this world, there is. Always some background of trouble. Now there is some kind of disorder, there is some kind of disharmony, and then through that the Lord appears. If we consider Lord Ram's appearance, you know there is that Dashrat and his queens. They were trying to have children for a long time. And somehow it was not happening, and then they perform yoga. So we can say born after after sacrifice. The sacrifice here was basically yoga. A special yoga was performed, and was born after that. Now, in the case of Shachi Mata, in the case of Gauranga Mahaprabhu, and before him, his brother was born, Vishwambar. So, so Vish. Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? Now there, they had children, but they kept losing their children. Mm -hmm. So, so there it was born after special Vishnu worship. You see, the Chaitanya Chaitanya says that Vishesh is the one that when they repeatedly they just couldn't have a child, when they performed. Rather than losing faith or becoming bitter, 
रुचि माता जगन्नाथ मिश्र दे परफॉर्म मोर एंड मोर वर्शिप ऑफ लॉर्ड विष्णु एंड विशेष सेवा एम एन डेटेड देन दे गॉट दिस शो सो बोथ ऑफ देम अपीयर्ड देयर इज सम हुएवर हैज दैट फॉर्च्यून ऑफ मेकिंग द लॉर्ड और एनीवन एनीथिंग सीक्रेट मैनिफेस्ट इन द वर्ल्ड दे हैव टू डू समथिंग स्पेशल the reason for that is that the 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 lord wants to see how much is our longing for him mm. so tatra laulyam api maulyam ekalam so i so the, it's not that krishna doesn't want to help us krishna doesn't want us krishna doesn't want to come but krishna wants to see how eager are we for him and when we say laulya It's an interesting word that Chaitanya Charitamrita uses. Now, the God of Vishnu tradition uses, especially the Bhakti Sam Sindhu, but other places also it comes. It's greed. Now, why lovelier specifically? Because the principle here is that we already have lovelier for many things in the world. So we may have lovelier for money, we may have lovelier for fame, we may have lovelier for power. So what needs to happen is. our desire for krishna has to become greater than our desire for the world for the world means for whatever things are there in the world it may be many things different things specifically but if not greater at least there has to be some level of comparable desire so we have the power of desiring and where are we directing that power of so both of them had to perform certain austerities so that the lord would appear now if we go forward from there afterwards but well, as i said i want to focus on key similarities not an overall analysis so what happens is in both cases the father departs now in the case of of lord ramachandra what happens is after his exile so lord ram is not there in fact dashrath maharaj departs out of heartbreak because lord ram has been sent up it's generally a parent Would rather take suffering on themselves rather than that their child suffer. That's just the nature of parenting. Mm-hmm. And in the case of Dashrath Maharaj, he's a king, he's a protector. You see, we all have certain things which we are good at, and not necessarily good in the sense that we are proud of that, but we know I can do this well. And then we can do that well to help others. If somebody is very good at cooking. then uh, if they are good at cooking then so they would like to cook and serve others if somebody is good at organizing somebody is good at managing somebody is good at logistics arrangement whatever then whatever is we are good at we try to use that for helping others if we have a service attitude and then if in the very thing we are good at if we are not held able to help others rather somehow our actions end up causing harm to us then it becomes unbearable so say somebody is a doctor and not just for money they really want to take care for others and then somehow something happens from the doctor side and the patient condition worsens or the patient dies now sometimes legally the doctor may be clear you know you did not do anything wrong but still morally the doctor will feel responsible So like that for Dashrath Maharaj, he is the protector, mm. and he would like to protect his children from all such things. He wants to give the best to his child, and somehow for him, that big, the thought that because of me, my son has to live in poverty. It's it's like you know you say it's the ultimate heartbreak for Dashrath Maharaj. What happens is. That instead of because it prevents suffering, 
That's what his heart wanted him, would have wanted to do. But the exact opposite is his cause suffering. Now the fact that he was obliged to do that, that's what he would have wanted. And this is what he would have dreaded. So when somehow there is something which is like a driving mission of our life. And we end up doing the very opposite of that. Then the pain becomes unbearable. This is what happens to Arjuna also in the Bhagavata, the first first canto of 14, 15 chapters. Arjuna is a protector. And when he fails to protect Krishna's queens, he's utterly devastated. And at that time there, somehow he remembers the message of the Bhagavad Gita. And he understands that whatever is happening, Krishna has a plan. That's how he somehow calms down. But the Shrita Maharaj is just not even, what is the point of living if I become the cause of suffering for my own son? I just can't maintain his life. So he departs. Now in the case of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it is that his father also departs. But he departs after Mahaprabhu's his elder brother Sanyas. Mm-hmm. So he's after Vishwarup Sanyas. He feels again the pain is similar. And there are Gaudi Vaishnava Acharyas who commented on this. So what they further described is that actually while Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very mischievous and Vishwarup was relatively mature, and both of them were being very close to each other. And Jagannath Krishna's fear was that. Just like Vishwarup has left home, maybe Vishwamba will also leave home. And we know the extent to which he went, he said, stop his education for some time. Because why the idea was that in the past, the idea was that Jnana almost always leads to Vairagya. Hmm? That the more knowledge we get, especially the knowledge of Shastra, then we understand the temporariness of this world. And then we become detached. So this was actually Vedic education. But actually today's education, it is what? The whole Jnana is for Raga. <laughs> not for Vairagya. The whole knowledge is about you know, how we can enjoy the world more. Scientific, technological advancement are basically at one level. Just ways to try to enjoy the world more. So, so he thought that I don't want my son to renounce. So he stopped his education. But then he was so spontaneously attracted. Vishwamba to education to study that. His father just couldn't stop. And they were sad. Everyone said, why are you stopping it? So then he reluctant to what he did. But still that dread was there for him. And so it was both. The cause was not just the loss of Vishwamba. But the fear that he had. Vishwambar may also do the same thing. And then we see that echo of that same thing later on in the Haridas Thakur Pastor. Haridas Thakur says, My dear Lord, I have understood that you are soon going to depart from the world. And he says, I can't bear to see that. Let me depart from the world before you. So there was, so in one sense, there is this agony. And then, after that, if we consider, it's like, there is the home, and then there is the forest. So there's a very beautiful verse in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, where the same verse, the Asharas have explained, can refer to Mahaprabhu, can refer to Krishna, can refer to Ram, can refer to Mahaprabhu. So, Tektva Sudustyajya Surepsita Raja Lakshmim Dharmishta Arya Vachasaya Daga Dharanyam Maya Mrugam Daite Ipsita Manvadhavad Vande Mahapurushate Charanarundam Vande Mahapurushate I offer my obeisance to that great law. So in that verse it says that Tektva Sudustyajya That which is very very difficult to give up. Surepsit Raja Lakshmi. 
that sura ipsit that which is aspired for by even the devtas raj lakshmi that which is blessed by the goddess of fortune or there is two meanings of that that which is blessed by the goddess of fortune or that which is blessed with the goddess of fortune it can mean both things that so tatva he gave it up so what happens is lord ram is in ayodhya and he goes to tandaka vanjana pavanara so first he goes to chitrakoot chitrakoot dadriniketan ram but then especially the big action starts and he goes to tandaka nandagaran now mahaprabhu is in mayapur now ayodhya of course was extremely prosperous it was blessed by the goddess of fortune but suddenly lord ram had to leave why arya vachasa arya vachasa is because of because of the word of arya of a brahmana this was another brahmana of arya arya refers to the brahmana of shakti or he is basically a respectable person as prabhu passes one who knows the value of life mm-hmm. so arya vachasa is the god aranyam a god aranyam he went to the forest so he went because dashrath maharaj had given that promise and he wanted to honor that word and in the case of mahaprabhu mayapur the whole navadvip area was actually both intellect it was intellectually prosperous it was intellectually a very renowned area and jagannath mishra and uh, rishimata were not very wealthy but they had what they needed uh, the, the say it's for different people based on what they value wealth is defined differently if somebody is interested in learning if somebody is interested in knowledge then if there is an environment where there are many learned people and there is a lot of deep discussion and they feel no, that's what is a wealthy place and that's why because it was so rich with the wealth of wisdom that's why there are pandits like kesho uh, kesho kashmiri Others, the Guji Pandit said, that would come to Mayapur to to try to establish their glory over there. So Mayapur was also prosperous in terms of the wealth that a Chetan Mahaprabhu was born in a Brahminical family would have. But then a god Aranyam. From there, where did he go? He wanted to go to Vrindavan. But where did he end up going? Okay. So this is interesting. What exactly happens? We'll discuss over here. That he goes to the forest. Arya vachasa yath agad aranyu. And then Maya mrugam daitya ipsitam anvadhavat. Anvadhavat means he followed. He chased. Maya mrugam the the maya muruga that word has different meanings what does it mean for lord ram's leela deer. deer the magical deer the illusory deer the golden deer <coughs> marichi who had taken up that form so maya murugam daitaya ipsitam anvadhavat so daitaya ipsitam that ipsitam is desire daitaya is by one who is dear so it it refers to that it, Sita desired it, and so Anvadhava, Lord Ram chased after that deer. So now, what is so special about this particular thing is that that Lord Ram, you know, is a more gusharam. It is described. His arrows never missed. And normally, when he had to fight, even when he was fighting against uh, the entire army of Karan Dushan, the fourteen thousand demons were there. And there, actually, Lord Ram just stood at one place, and he didn't have to run. Even when he is fighting against, uh, he fought before that against Subahu and Tataka, and even later on when he is fighting against uh, Ravan, now there are very little incident, few incidents of Lord Ram actually running from here to there. He is just so powerful at fighting that from one place. So normally, when you're fighting, you know, enemy fire is there. You try to dodge the fire. You try to find a strategically the best place to be in. But Lord Ram was so good at fighting that he 
that he just went one place and destroyed the entire army of current nation. So, but that Lord Ram he changed. That's why this particular incident is special. Anvadhavat. Now, why did he change? At one level, it was because he wanted to please Mother Sita. He felt Sita has given up so much for me. She didn't have to come with me to the forest. But she came. And she has practically never asked me for anything. So now she has asked me for this beer. I must get it for her. So, that, that the similar aspiration is that when in the, in the Pandavas are in the forest, at that time, Draupadi, they are by a lake, the Ganga lake, and Dagni Ganga, and then they see that a thousand petal lotus has come down. It's flowing. And Draupadi sees her, her, her light, eyes light up. And when Bhima sees that, he just jumps down and gets, gets, gets that for her. Now, at this point, Arjuna is not there. Arjuna has gone to the heavens for performing tapas, uh, gone for performing tapas, they are forgetting celestial levels. And then, oh, see how do I, so happy Draupadi is, Draupadi is, can you, where is this come from a thousand petal lotus? Can you get more of these? So, oh, Bhima says, yes, I'll go get it. And he goes up the Himalaya, that's where he meets Hanuman, and all the things happen out there. So the point is, that the desire is to please so that with that desire, he chases, Lord Ram chases. Now, that's for Lord Ram. Now, what does it mean for Chaitanya, for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? So, Maya Mruga Daitaya Ipsitam Anvadhava. He says that all the living entities are like the Maya Mruga. That they are all, they are all illusioned by Maya. So there it is like Lord Ram chased after the illusory deer. But here it's like we are the deer who are chasing after illusion. And the deer is chasing after illusion. And what is happening is that Lord Ram is chasing after that deer. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is chasing after that deer. Maya Mrudam Daitaya. Because the living beings are so dear to him. Ipsitam Anvadhavad. So... If you look at, we hear about Mahaprabhu South India tour, we hear it North India tour. In those times, touring was not at all easy. And Mahaprabhu went to so many places. At one level, Mahaprabhu as Sanyasi was going to various holy places. But actually, he was not just going to holy places, he was making places holy. <laughs> By his traveling, he was actually in Mahaprabhu's tours. Externally speaking, they were to go to holy places. Mm -hmm. But he was going to those holy places, but while he was going there, he was also, the places where he was staying, going, he was making them holy. He was inspiring everyone to chant the holy names, to become infused with love for the Lord. And in this way, he actually enriched the hearts of everyone. Now Lord Ram, there are, uh, when he uh, was there, he, is every avatar, like we say, he has a purpose. Valmiki Ramayana starts by saying that Lord Ram's purpose was to, in one sense, uh, establish the character and behavior of ideal person. And the ideal person is in the Ramayana is one who is ready to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So Lord Ram sacrifices for the sake of his father. So that sacrifice is a mood that runs throughout the Ramayana. And that culmination of that is when, just like there is what, if you see the Ramayana sequence, you must say the key incident is Dashrat and Ram. And there is a great sacrifice over there. Where Dashrat has no desire to send Ram away. But he is obliged. He is obliged. Now, 
in today's world to some extent we can understand and if you give your word you must keep it in the past for kshatriyas they were defined by that have to keep your word mm. so so that sacrifice happened because of some obligation and that same mood of sacrifice culminates in ram and sita being separated now externally the reason seems to be different that sita was accused of something and you say how did ram do something like that he supposed to be just he supposed to be just yes he is just but in this case the lord ram never considered sita to be in any way contaminated at all and even if she was not her fault she was so why should she be held responsible at all the point over there is that the specifics of the rationale why did lord ram have to send sita away those are something which are not as important as the principle that lord ram <coughs> and sita are demonstrating the ultimate sacrifice that just as dashrath had no desire to send ram away and it is not that ram was a victim when dashrath sent him away similarly ram actually had no desire to send sita away and sita is not a victim when ram sends him away sita is of course heartbroken when she has to go away from ram this is dashrath is heartbroken so that lord ram is also distressed when he has to go away from his father and that's why he is in the in the in the forest when he comes to know that ram is the sudhas pastor then he offers water in the forest in the river he cannot he is not there to do last rites of his father so similarly lord ram they had no desire to send sita away but because of circumstances he was obliged to do that and he did that He still had complete faith in Sita's purity, and that's why he would have her effigy with her when he would perform yagyas, and no one objected. And the Brahmins who performed the yagya, they would have objected if they considered that there's some impurity over there. But there's absolutely no impurity. So rather than seeing this as you know, Lord Ram believing in some unsubstantiated accusation or things like that. the principle of the drama and the thread is of sacrifice and everybody has to sacrifice in their own ways and the world the most difficult kind of sacrifice is the kind of sacrifice when you give a lot and you don't get praise for it rather you get criticism for it you suppose say we are building a new temple and then somebody gives a lot of money And normally, somebody gives a lot of donation. They, you know, they are glorified. They should be glorified in Lord's service. But suppose somebody gives a huge amount of donation and they do it anonymously, and nobody comes to know about it, and they don't get any praise for it. But everybody thinks, you know, you have so much wealth and you are not giving any donation. <laughs> the person who has been most generous. Gets criticized for being miser. <laughs> How difficult would it be? Hmm? So actually, that is the sacrifice that Sita has to perform. So she she is heartbroken, but she understands. She doesn't become bitter. She doesn't become angry with Ram. She understands what is going on, and the proof that she understands is that she never poisons the minds of her children. She didn't tell them, you know, Ram is such a terrible person. He abandoned me. He abandoned me. <coughs> She doesn't do that. So the gopis are considered such exalted devotees because they give themselves up to Krishna. And at least the queens in Dwarka, they had Krishna's name. They were lawfully married wives. The gopis didn't even have Krishna's name, so they gave everything to Krishna, and Krishna apparently gave them up. So. That is actually very exalted level of sacrifice. The sacrifice is in a continuum. Mm-hmm. First is that we give up the bad. Mm-hmm. Say like we follow more regular principles. So sacrifice in the service of God in bhakti you can say. 
we give the bad or the sinful then after that so we could say bad and sinful then we could say just we give up materialism mm -hmm. we stop chasing a lot of wealth lot of material things and power but then after we are we may we may have to give up the good good in terms of those who really renounce and live a simple life they even may not even take the basics we have the go swami would live under different trees so good in terms of basic material things that may also be given up but good in terms of even a pious reputation when that has to be given up that is the greatest sacrifice so sita actually does that sacrifice that the gopis do that sacrifice now in one case in one sense what happened with chaitanya mahaprabhu is that when chaitanya mahaprabhu eventually takes sanyas then that is a great sacrifice for him the sacrifice for him it is sacrifice for his family it is sacrifice for all the devotees now if you see when if we try to approach the lords in past times from a pure just a materialistic vision then sometimes it's very difficult to understand mm -hmm. we need to look at it from a deeper vision so there's one one bengali commentator he is a little article became a little bit online so he says that no he says chaitanya mahaprabhu is god he was going to renounce then why did he have to marry again is it after his first wife passed away he married again and then he abandoned her <laughs> he would not have just married also but the point is that the 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 consorts of chaitanya mahaprabhu they are also the goddesses of fortune they are eternally there with him and with his vishnu priya or lakshmi priya so they are eternally with him they are like bhudevi so as you say like that they yes every various ways they are described but the point is that they are also illustrating a mood of sacrifice so when the lord departed Now he actually spoke to every one of his associates in my opinion any one of his associates he told all of them that that i have to renounce that i have to spread the holy name and i have to and the only way i can do it is if i take some years then the message will be respected devotees were devastated mahaprabhu sat down with vishnu priya also explained to him he told shachi mata and it is it, that, that whole section in chaitanya leela is one of the most heart wrenching sections when chaitanya mahaprabhu is leaving and in fact there are some chaitanya mahaprabhu's writings chaitanya mahaprabhu's past time as his but some of his biographies they just don't describe mahaprabhu's journey as past times why they just, uh, because you know, it's so painful mm. so like that even there are some lord ram's retellings that Ra ram and gorjus they just don't talk about sita's being sent away uh, so it's it's actually sometimes sacrifice is painful and mahaprabhu as a sanyasi is demonstrating a certain level of renunciation which is in the supreme lord and it is demonstrating the supreme level of renunciation the supreme level of renunciation is that um, i was uh, i was in pune when i was 15 years ago so one one day one boy came to me and he said you know what is the process for becoming a brahmachari mm -hmm. now <laughs> i hardly ever seen him in the temple not doing any services so i said you really want to become a roman chair sit yes but sunday i'll be deciding <laughs> <laughs> really i said what is going to happen on sunday he said i have proposed to a girl and she said she will reply by sunday <laughs> if she says no i'll become a roman chair <laughs> so now Actually, 
there is a huge difference between frustration and renunciation. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is the difference between frustration and renunciation is that it is actually the differentiation between starving and fasting. <laughs> The two are not the same thing at all. Is that it? It's like in my you can say there are two things over here. Eh? There is the desire to enjoy, and then there is the ability to enjoy. So when there is frustration, what happens is is there the desire to enjoy? Yes. Yes, yes it is very much there. But the ability to enjoy is not there. <laughs> now and now, ideally speaking, when there's renunciation, actually, there is the ability to enjoy, but there is no desire to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Now, when Mahaprabhu renounced the world, it was not because there was frustrated family life. Vishnu mm -hmm. uh, was the most devoted wife, and they had a very sweet family. So, when he renounced, it was, it was a sacrifice for both of them. Like there's an American comedian who said that, you know, my wife and I, you know, we drive in different cars, we eat at different times, we live in different room, door rooms, we come and go out of different doors. We are doing everything to keep our marriage together. <laughs> 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 so, it's already a shallow shell, there's nothing in it already, but better not like that. So Mahaprabhu demonstrates renunciation. And what was the purpose of the renunciation? That that spirit of sacrifice was so that more and more people would actually benefit from the blessing that he was giving. The blessing of the holy name, the blessing of the Yuga Dharma, of ultimately of Krishna praying. And ultimately, I said the Lord's descent, the human divine descent is to inspire the human ascent. So what is that human ascent? The human ascent is ultimately that mood of sacrifice, of selflessness. Of, so for each one of us, now we may never have to renounce the world. Even as uh, most of us, uh, even though those of us who are brahmacharis, we may renounce the world in one sense, but we are still very much in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the principle is not so much what we renounce, but it is what we renounce for. You know, what are we trying to do after renunciation? So, so that mood of sacrifice, you know, it is, there are two aspects to it, what we give up and then what we take up. Mm -hmm. What made Prabhupada special was not just that he took sannyas. You know, there were many of his god brothers who were lifelong sannyasis. Mm -hmm. uh, but what distinguished Prabhupada, his god brothers also exalted, exalted souls. At the same time, it was Prabhupada who fulfilled the prophecy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the Achaitanya Gadati Krama. Sarvatta Pacharoni Murna. In every town and village, my name will be chanted. So, what made that happen was not that Prabhupada gave up, I'm sorry, but what he took up. He took up the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu like no one else. You know, what Prabhupada's mood was that that Mahaprabhu's prophecy is my responsibility. Is that because the Lord has said it, the Lord has said this will happen, so he will make it happen. No, not like that. Prabhupada says one lecture, and Krishna shows Arjuna the Vishwarupa. And Krishna says, Krishna shows him how all the warriors on the opposite side have been destroyed. So Prabhupada Says in Arjuna doesn't say Krishna, anyway you destroyed all of them, so why do I have to fight? Just destroy them. So it is said, I will take the response. So this is 
the so the mood of your father. So in our particular place, wherever we are, you know, how can we take up that responsibility of serving Shri Prabhupada, serving Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, serving the mission of the Lord when we descend to the world? It is that responsibility that we take up that is what ultimately enables us to grow in our spiritual life. Prabhupada will say that our spiritual advancement is proportional to the responsibility that we take. So, you know, responsibility in the bhakti sense has a special, sometimes you feel, you know, I have, I don't have this ability. You know, maybe I can't preach, I can't distribute books, I can't manage. There's so many things I can't do. So actually, in bhakti, it is a devotional responsibility. It is, we all have heard this, responsibility, response plus ability. But in bhakti, it is special responsibility. Yes, it is our response to God's ability. That it is our response to God's ability. And I may not be able to do it, but God can do it. And if he wants to do it through me, he can make me an instrument to do it. So Prabhupada says in the Markini Bhagavad Dharma song that, that my dear Lord, I don't know why you brought me here. I, I guess you must have some purpose. But he says, My dear Lord, by your inconceivable potency, everything is possible. So, it is by your arrangement, everybody has come under Maya. It is, if your will is there, then you please give me the words by which I can make your message understandable to them. Alankruta Koribara Kamata Tomar. You have the power to make my words, to ornament my words in such a way that they can be understandable to them. And you can nachao, nachao, prabhu, nachao, se mate. So it is, Krishna is omnipotent. Now, will Krishna use us to do extraordinary things? Krishna can if he wants. But, but even if Krishna doesn't, if we try to serve Krishna, in that attempt, it is up to Krishna to decide. This is what you are asking me. And we say that, become an instrument in God's hands. What does it mean? Does it mean that we give credit to Krishna for everything that we do? Well, yes, that's true. But to become an instrument means, it's like if a warrior is there. With the warrior, there's a sword, there's a bow and arrow, there might be a spear, there might be a mace. And it's up to the warrior to choose which weapon to use. But all the weapons are there, ready for the warrior. So like that, when we want to be an instrument, that means, we are ready to serve. Now, it's up to the warrior to decide which weapon they will use. So, whether and how we will be used, we will be engaged by Krishna. That is up to Krishna. So, some devotees, they will be used to do extraordinary service. Now, others may say, you know, what about they are not used. And you see some devotees are just such that they start distributing books and they just distribute books as if you know, it's like they are distributing gulab jamun and people are running to take gulab jamun. <laughs> 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 they seem to have that ability and they distribute some thousand books in one day. You know, was devoting thousand books in a year, they will not be able to distribute. It's so Krishna can empower people in some ways. Some devotees, they, they do classes and Thousands are mesmerized. Some devotees, they raise points. And it's just amazing how they are Krishna manifests his vibhuti through them. Some kids are kirtans. It's amazing. So, Krishna can use different people as instruments in miraculous ways. But the important thing is that, you know, even if Krishna does not use us as an instrument to do something extraordinary, by our readiness to be used, something will extraordinarily happen to us. It is we will become purified. 
just by that surrender. So, there are two different things. When we have that desire to serve, when we have that, we take the responsibility to be an instrument. Then, there are two kinds of extraordinary things that can happen. One is, extraordinary things can happen through us. That we do amazing service, and the amazing nature of that service is manifested in this world also. But even if that doesn't happen, extraordinary things will happen to us. That means our heart will get transformed. And in one sense, this is guaranteed. Krishna says, this is uncertain. It depends on Krishna. But this is certain. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjay spoke the same Gita to Duryodhan. So to Dhritarashtra. Sanjay's heart was not transformed. So Dhritarashtra's heart was not transformed. But Sanjay's heart was transformed. Vishyamicha puna puna. So in one sense, what Krishna said, Karmande Vadika Asti Mahapanishu Gadachu Pani says, that is demonstrated in the last five verses of the Gita, 74 to 78. So the Gita would have ended in 1873 when Krishna Arjuna's conversation is over. Why are the next five verses there? And there, although Sanjay did not experience success in changing Dhritarashtra's heart, but just by speaking the message, Sanjay's heart changes. And that is the glorious thing. So in that sense, in the endeavor of bhakti, there will always be success. Now, this inner success will always be there. But the outer success, it will also be there, but the extent of it will depend on Krishna. But if we just take up the sacrifices of taking up responsibility to become an instrument according to our capacity, and Krishna will want to do wonders, either through us or at least to us. I think that is the common principle. They said, Lord Ram and Paul word. Hanuman to go to Lanka. That's actually, that's what I'm going to speak the main part of the class, but I don't think we'll have time for it. But I'm going to think on how this, that is Lord Ram empowered Hanuman to go to Lanka. And one of the most beautiful parts of the, not one of the most beautiful part, the most cherished part of the Rama is the Sundar Kant. Mm-hmm. Uh, so similarly, it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who empowered Prabhupada to come here to America. And the man says the most beautiful part of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, at least for us, as followers of Prabhupada, is the, the pastimes of Prabhupada. They're non different. Just like in the Sundarkand, actually, in most of the Sundarkand, Lord Ram is not present at all. Right in the beginning and only at the end. Like that, actively speaking, in Prabhupada Leela, Mahaprabhu is not present. But Mahaprabhu is there everywhere. It's by Mahaprabhu's mercy. So, what is the Sundarkand in Ramayana that is similar to Prabhupada Dilamrat? That it is, it's Prabhupada's pastimes are the manifestation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy in the life of a devotee who took up the responsibility to serve the Lord. See, when Hanuman went to Lanka, Hanuman did not know that he had all those abilities. Because of the curse, he had forgotten those abilities. But, Lord Ram wants me to do it, I will do it. And then at the right time, he was reminded of those abilities and manifested those abilities. So Prabhupada in one sense, he had very little success in the outreach in India. Prabhupada, with confidence in Mahaprabhu, came into America and all over the world. And Krishna worked through Prabhupada in extraordinary ways. So the sweetest verses in the uh, in the uh, Nam Ramayana is uh, 108, 118s of Lord Ram and then summarize the entire mass time. So it is Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama Tadgati Vigna Dhrasaka Rama So Kapivara is Hanuman Santata Chintita Rama So Hanuman constantly remembered Lord Ram and what did Lord Ram do in return? Tadgati, in his progress, in his pathway, Vigna, whatever obstacles were there, Dhamsaka Rama. So although Lord Ram was not there, Lord Ram was there in his heart acting, and Lord Ram was acting external, removing obstacles for him. 
And that is a dynamic that can manifest in the lives of all of us. That if we take up the responsibility to serve the Lord, that means when we say remember Krishna, we not just forget the word and remember Krishna. It's remember Krishna so that we can be empowered to serve the Lord and do his mission in this world. So let's recite this once and then we'll stop. I'll somewhere we'll stop. So this is a very nice uh, meditation. Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama. Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama. Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama. Tadgara Santata Chintita Rama. Tadgati Vigina Dhamsaka Rama. Tadgati Vigina Dhamsaka Rama. Tadgati Vigina Dhamsaka Rama. Both lines together once. Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama Tadgati Vigna Vamsaka Rama Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama Tadgati Vigna Vamsaka Rama Kapivara Santata Chintita Rama you know, the same mood is there in Chaitanya Chaitanya also. Athanjan Sute is pleasing. He said that if you remember Lord Chaitanya, then the impossible becomes possible. That is the power of the remembrance of the Lord. And that is what Prabhupada gives us in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So many resources that you can remember the Lord and thereby become empowered. So I'll summarize what we discussed today. Our broad topic was the parallels in Ram Lila and Kaur Lila. And the many parallels. So the first was right from the beginning of like there is always sacrifice to make the Lord appear. So both Vichy Mata Nidanath Mishra and Dashrat and his queens, they had to do sacrifice. And then when the Lord appears, he has one common mission. He descends to inspire our ascent. So the human ascent. And the human ascent happens in two different ways. It is dharma for at that time. Mm -hmm. But then it is his lila and his shiksha. It is there for all time. <laughs> and through that, through that, that is the legacy that we use for everyone to take it forward. Then we discussed about how there was heartbreak hmm, for the both fathers. For the Shrut Maharaj, it was that his son had to go away and he became the cause of his son's going away. For Jagannath Mishra, it was that one of his sons had gone away and the other may also go away. And he just said, I can't live to see that. And then we discussed that particular verse. And um, so the Taktva Asmusti Surya Pistaraji Lakshmi. There we discussed the mood of sacrifice. It was the Rama and sacrifice, what starts from Dashrath and Ram, that ends with Rama and Sita. So the greatest sacrifice is, in one sense, where we sacrifice a lot and we don't, we sacrifice even the good name or the good name from piety. We don't even get that. So we sacrifice, first we sacrifice the bad, then we sacrifice the material, then we sacrifice the good material, good things, but then even good subtle things we sacrifice. Then that sacrifice is Sita performed. And for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when we talk about his sannyas, hmm, that was not out of frustration. If many people, when they conduct with sannyas, they, they, conduct, they think it's renunciation, but it's primarily frustration. And the difference is like the difference between starving and fasting. It is, the desire is there, but the ability is not there. That's frustration. But the ability is there, but the desire is not there. That's your renunciation. And the last part we discussed is that what we do, we don't have necessarily like sannyas, but we also take up responsibility to serve. And responsibility means it is our response 
to God's ability. So it is God has unlimited ability and when we become an instrument. So this is Prabhupada took the responsibility. Nachao, nachao, pra nachao simati. So by that, there will be outer miracle that can happen through us and there is an inner miracle that will happen to us. And this is certain to happen. And that's the ultimate success for us in our spiritual life. That we become connected with the Lord and according to how the Lord wants to use us, we connect others with the Lord. Thank you very much. Hare with Ravan, when we know that the Sita Mata is uh, more powerful than the Ravan, when Amen. Sita Mata is a child, Amen. that time she pulled up the uh, Sivdhanus, but Ravana didn't pull up that Any specific reason she didn't fought with uh, Yeah. Well, there's one answer which can seem to be like a non-answer. <laughs> that is in the Leela of the Lord. <laughs> but uh, there are other reasons also, see. There is Leela, but there is another point over there that in general, if you see within the past times of the Lord, the omnipotence of the Lord or the omnipotence of the associates of the, in this case of the consort of the Lord, that is very rarely manifest. It is not very rarely, but it is intermittently manifest. It is that See, Lord Ram is God. Now God is, is, is everywhere with hands and legs. So when Sita is being abducted, no, Lord Ram, he can just extend his hands and catch Ram. Isn't it? Or Lord Ram can just show his Vishwaru and he will be there right next to him. So the whole point of this whole past time, you must have Ram realized that, it is to teach humans how to function. So now if you see that's why one of the names of Lord Ram is Agastya Nugraha Vardhita Ram. That by the blessings of Agastya, he became even more powerful. The sage Agastya. Now you say Lord Ram is the one who is giving all blessings, including to Agastya. So why does he, in fact, according to some writing of Rama, that when he remembers what Agastya has told him, then he meditates and then he gets that forward. That's when they will kill Ram in each other. So the idea is, Lord Ram is not acting like God only. He is acting like a human being, an ideal human being. And as an ideal human being, he faces struggles. Now he is extraordinary archer. That, that no doubt that, but that's like his superlative talent. That doesn't mean anything. It's not that he is exhibiting the omnipotence while he is fighting. He is exhibiting superlative ability. Mm -hmm. So he rarely exhibits his godhood over there. Like, so that's why Lord Ram, you know, with his own arrows he can kill. But Lord Ram uses Brahmastra, he uses other astras to kill the various demons. Why? Because the whole point is that if a human being faces adversities, then what does a human being do? A human being should do tapasya and with higher blessings gain powers. So whether it is by the blessing of the sages one gets powers, or when it is blessing by the devutas one gets power. The principle is, Lord, the whole pastime of Lord Ram is not where the Lord Ram, Lord, the entire Ram Lila in general, is about, it's about ideal behaviors for the human being. And that is why, to some extent, as we carefully understood that, to some extent, in like some people when they read the Valmiki Rama and they read the Ramcharit Manas, they feel the bhakti comes much more in Ramcharit Manas than in Rama, Valmiki Rama. 
And yes, it, there is a truth to that. Or not just for Ramchand Manas, many other later written in the Ramayana. The Bhakti seems to be more. Because why? The Valmiki Ramayana's purpose is to demonstrate how an ideal person behaves in the challenge, challenge of this world. And that's why the divinity of Lord Ram is not too much emphasized on Because then, you can say, oh, he's God, he can do anything, I can't do that. So that's not the mood. Uh, and in one sense, that's why you'll see in the Ramayana, the other characters are also glorious. Lakshman sacrifice is great, Bharat sacrifice is great. And uh, that is then when they are doing sacrifice, they are not emphasizing that they are God. So the divinity in one said, divinity is somewhat downplayed. It is definitely there, but it is downplayed. As compared to that, the subsequent telling of the Rama, written of the Ramayana, many of them are not so much to demonstrate how Lord Ram is an ideal human being. It is to demonstrate how wonderful is Lord Ram. And how wonderful he is and how we should be devoted to him. So it's like there are two different purposes. That Lord Ram as an ideal human being. And I as the wonderful Lord. Wonderful, worshipable Lord. These are two different purposes in the mindset. So, in the subsequent retelling, the second purpose has been emphasized. This is Valmiki Dramas purpose. And this is retelling. So, in the, at least in the original book, the divinity is not a, of Lam not emphasized. And Sita also, there are an indication, no doubt about it. But it is not emphasized. So that's why, in the, in the mood of the overall pastime, it is that you know, Sita could have exhibited her, her omnipotence and she could have she could die with Rama. But that how is does that teach anything to any any people in today's world? Or in subsequent world, you know? We don't have that kind of omnipotence. So as a Sita plays the role that can uh, inspire people who go through similar difficulties. Now how to act in that situation? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. First of excellent method of the presentation, both what you're writing and speaking. It absorbs the mind, so it doesn't run the other day. So thank you for that, Prabhu. My question is regarding that sacrifice and frustration. So we have the tendency to enjoy but not the ability. And renunciation is when you have the ability but you, it doesn't, you don't want to enjoy it. Now I was thinking about a sadhana. So we had a life before Krishna consciousness which was sense gratification. And now we have our do's and don'ts that we're following. So, because of our conditioning, Prabhu, there is a level of frustration. You want to enjoy, but as a discipline, you're holding back. And then what happens as time goes by, this becomes very mechanical. And there is always some residual anchoring that I want to go back. Or, you know, am I doing the right thing, doubt, whatever. All this thing comes in. But it's a discipline and it's also like a force. It's not coming naturally, those much good. So Prabhu, what is it that a sadhaka can do that though he has that desire to enjoy, he, mm. it makes no difference to him. Of course, sadhana will take you there one day. But the process to reach there itself is very frustrating for the Yes, thank you, sir. It's a uni almost universally relatable question. <clears throat> it's a two different things over here. If we consider the spectrum of activity in Bhakti, <laughs> there are some activities in which 
may require strength. That means, say, if you had a fast on Ekadashi, maybe that requires strength. You chant some extra rounds. There are regular rounds. A chanting may require the strength. But then, there are some activities which give strength also. Maybe we like to come in the social media devotees, we like kids, and we like to hear classes. There are things like that. So, bhakti is not one moment tactic. That, you know, okay, I have to push myself in everything. There are some aspects of bhakti I need to push myself in. And there are some aspects which, which they pull me towards them. So, we need to make sure that if we have that thing that gives strength, we do them sufficiently. Now, sufficiently means that we do them at least enough so that we have the strength. Now we may say our sadhana itself is supposed to give us this strength. Yes, that is true. But each of us has a personal relationship with Krishna. And that's why you cannot say mechanically, you will do one, two, three, you will take a list of bullet points and then you will be connected with Krishna. No, for some people it might be more connection through one thing. For some people it might be more connection through another thing. So we need to make sure that we do the activity that connects us with Krishna. And give us that strength. And then Bhakti will not be like such a struggle. It is a struggle, but it will not be that much of a struggle. If we can balance. And, and similarly, we can say regulation or restraint that is there. There also is a spectrum. There is some regulation that is easy. And there is some regulation that is tough. So for example, if say we are going by a car or by a plane or a train, and say the neighbor next to us is sitting and eating meat. Now, very few of us will be tempted by the meat. Now that is, we got the higher taste over it. So, now there are some other things. Maybe, maybe they are watching some movie and we feel attracted toward that. It's a different thing. So, it's not that everything is a struggle. So, the things that now are easy, or you could say, most of the things have become easy for us. That means, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, I wouldn't have attracted to that, but now I am not attracted. So these can give us faith and hope that the process of bhakti does work. That, and it has worked in my heart also. There are some conditions which may take more time. And then with respect to that, it is tough. You know, it's regulation is, it can be done in different ways. Sometimes, we may have to negotiate with our mind. Negotiate means that if, uh, say, some desire is uh, very strong, and as long as it is within the boundaries of dharma, a person can give themselves a little, uh, little leeway. The whole idea is that yukta ahara vihara se, that vihara is also there in yukta. We call it entertainment. In other words, we follow the entertainment dancing in Kirtans. Well, yes, it is. But each person is an individual. Not everybody will be entertained by the same thing. Different people may need different kinds of unwinding, relaxing. So, now, not all, not everything material is the same thing. It's like, say, for example, sometimes we have this idea that this is spiritual and this is material. And I have to give up the material and I have to go towards the spiritual. Well, that is true at one level, but another way of looking at this is, let's say this is spiritual and this is material. And in the material, there is sattva, there is rajas, and there is tamas. So, sattva is pro-devotional, rajas is non-devotional, tamas is anti-devotional. The three are not the same thing. So, if somebody just wants some relaxation, we decide that, no, I'll go, we will go for a walk to nature. Or I will, I will go to some, some peaceful place in, in the world or somewhere like that. And we say, there is no Krishna. Well, Krishna is there. But if that's what comes, it's not a something. 
It's absolutely no harm. In Rajasik, it say that um, ideally, that it's very easy for us to have to get caught in this. But each person has to find out. Say, especially if a person has, <laughs> is serious about practicing bhakti, um, then uh, then they can find out what is required for their mind and body to function most effectively in Krishna's service. So like, you know, how much food should somebody eat? So there's no absolute mandate for it. In our tradition, we have Radha Swami and we have Bhimasen also. <laughs> so we can be the Bhimasen Parampara. <laughs> Not much problem. It's, uh, maybe there is, but the point is, that there, is, there are some boundaries that are adjustable. And each one of us needs to find out what is the boundary within which I can practice Bhakti system. Mm -hmm. So, when we find that out, then, okay, I'll give an example. And don't misquote me or misapply this example. And I'm just giving this as an example to illustrate this point of pro devotion. There's one devotee friend of mine. He was, uh, before coming to Bhakti, he was big time into chess. He would have become a chess professional. But then, in India at those times, uh, his sport career was not so much encouraged. So he didn't do that, but he loved chess. So he said, I started practicing Bhakti, just gave it up. But after 15, 20 years, 15 years or so, I started feeling a great craving for playing chess. I said, I'm not going to do this. So he said, Maya. But then he said, you know, one day I just, I just, Nowadays you can be computer chess. So he said, I just played a 10 minute game. And he said, just 10 minute game. I just felt so refreshed. And he said, then, after that, I sat down, I was reading the Bhagavatam, and most of the time I was reading Bhagavatam, I was feeling sleepy. And this day, you know, it's like my mind was, was uh, sharpened. And I was able to get into the Bhagavatam. This is not a recommendation to play chess. <laughs> my point is that each one of us has to find out how best we can serve Krishna. So now if that 10 minutes chess game becomes a one hour chess game and there's no time for Bhagavatam, that's, that's obviously a possibility. And that possibility one has to guard against that. But if somebody needs to do that, like some devotees, before chanting, they do some deep breathing. Now I say, oh, the holy name is the biggest thing. We don't need anything else. True. But it's not, it's not mechanical. Each person has their own mind and senses. If somebody will do some deep breathing, calms their mind down, and then they can focus better on chanting. So instead of seeing that as non-devotional, we see that as anukulyas to sankal. Now, now playing chess might be anukul for someone, playing chess might be particular for someone else. So then that, that's why there has to be individual responsibility to find the boundaries within which we can push. And when we do that, then Bhakti really is such a drag. And of course, we have to be careful that when we expand some boundaries, we don't keep expanding the boundaries. That's why that core, core honesty and sincerity has to be there. But Bhakti should not be constantly a drag. It has to be bhajata priti purvakam. It shouldn't be bhajata, you know, Complete Purvakam. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. So, I have written a couple of new things. This is a, a latest book on the Ramayana. Living the Ramayana. So, there are about nine incidents from the Ramayana that I analyzed and practical life lessons are drawn. So one of the traumatic incidents from the Ramayana is Sita's abduction. Mm -hmm. So now, who, who is responsible for that? Of course, Ravan is the cause of it. But then Sita, she neglected the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And she came out. So you know, what is the role of boundaries in our life? That is explained. Or for that matter, Hanuman was alone in Lanka. And he seemed to be unsuccessful. Nothing was working out. So he was dejected and everything. So when we feel lonely, when we feel 
feel like a failure. How can we find strength? What did Hanuman do at that time? How can we find strength and discouragement? That, so, incidents of the Ramayana are narrated and like this is drawn from them. That's one book. And this is... I had a calendar last year with 365 quotes. So this is a separate calendar with another set of 365 quotes. They are inspired by the Bhagavad Gita. Each of these is based on one one words of the Gita. Hold your plan lightly. Hold your Lord tightly. Hmm? We often do the opposite. Hmm? So, people who can't face books, take shelter in Facebook. <laughs> To be detached, we don't need to be cold-hearted, we just need to be level-headed. Emotion is not to be rejected, domination by emotion is to be rejected. Our spiritual growth does not depend on our ability, it depends on our availability. This is what today we talked about, being an instrument, being ready to be an instrument. So like that each of these is quote inspired of, each of these is inspired by one one verse from the Bhagavad Gita, a verse is mentioned below. If you Google these quotes, they will take you to my website gitaliyu.com where there is an article explaining the quote as well as the words on which it is based. So, these two are available. I am also here in case you want to sign in the books. I wish you all a very happy God Purnima. Jatan Mahaprabhu Ki Jai Chandra Bhagavan Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Bhagavan